Hey everyone, welcome back to their hardware news recap for the week. In this one, we'll be talking about our sound chamber being up and running for the first real data coming out of our main lab here. We have, of course, the normal computer testing lab. And then we also have the more advanced one. So we have our first set of data coming out of that. Some quick news on that one. Uh, for hardware news and industry news, the RTX 4090 and 4080 have continued to get more details, including potential release dates and launch windows. There's some additional X670 and X670 e motherboards that have been announced in the AM5 family for AMD's upcoming Zen 4 CPUs and some other stuff like GTX 1630s and use, use, user benchmark. Before that, this video is brought to you by KaleMod's PCIe 4.0 riser cables, available in 90 degree and straight connections. The PCIe Gen 4 riser cables run up to 30 centimeters long and pair well with KaleMod's vertical GPU brackets, designed to maintain a more optimal distance between the video card fans and the case side panel. KaleMod markets that these have full speed signal transmission because they use a pure copper tinning process to achieve better signal quality. Learn more at the link in the description below. First one's really quick for you, some GN news. So first of all, we are now ramping back into our regular production cadence. We, as I said last time, we took some time to really refine processes and make things more scalable, get some more better uh, testing procedures and protocols in place so that it doesn't just all fall on mostly me and Patrick to run stuff that we've been running for a decade now. It allows us to get Mike, for example, who's been killing it with the cooler testing involved in CPU and GPU testing, which I'm really excited about because that will increase a couple things. One of them is it increases our capacity to rerun CPUs and GPUs more frequently. Uh, the data doesn't typically change too much year over year or even quarter to quarter. But sometimes it changes a lot. It just depends on kind of what drivers are coming out, what games are updating, things like that. So it'll help us to be able to keep data more up to date than it is even now. Additionally, we got testing procedures in place for using our acoustic chamber. You may have seen the video for that previously. Quite a large unboxing to do, but I'm super excited because we have it up and running. We used it for data. The data is in a video and it's ready to go live. So this news video will go up first. And then on Monday, you're going to see our video comparing the Steam Deck's two different fans. We'll be doing some noise level comparisons with extreme accuracy and precision, a high confidence with a super low noise floor of about 14 dBA. And then uh, we're down from 26, by the way. And then we'll also have frequency spectrum analysis, which we're new to. So you'll have to give us some room there to learn what we're doing, get more confidence, but really excited about that. So things are going in an awesome direction here. We'll have some pretty cool data coming up soon. We basically took advantage of this slow period right now in hardware launches to just fix everything internally so that we can do even more cool stuff as new hardware comes out. So that's the update on those items. Uh, we also have some advanced power testing for an undisclosed project coming up. So you'll want to stick around for that. Probably within about two weeks, you're going to see that one go live. Final GN news item, just really quickly, we just restocked our Blueprint shirts. So we have a lot of them in stock. They're on the store on store.gamersnexus.net. If you want to support us while getting a really cool shirt design in return, you can grab one of those and it helps fund what we're doing here. First news item is about NVIDIA's RTX 40 series. This is in the rumor category, but it's starting to look more and more true each day. Currently, the uh, serial leaker copite 7 kimi on Twitter posted a... Uh, a quote unquote confirmation such that we can get one at this point of the launch order for the RTX 40 series as 4090, 4080, 4070. Um, typically, well, actually NVIDIA's changed it quite a bit over the years, but typically they come out with an 80 class card first, then you get a TI or something a little bit like six months later. Here, 4090 is coming up. Now we have our own information to add to this. So we spoke to some of the board partners in the industry and we were able to independently confirm that with obviously off record sources that yes, the 4090 will be coming out very early in the life cycle of the 40 series, if not as the first card, it might be alongside of 4080, but they'll be pretty close together. So uh, that's gonna be an interesting card to work on. We're actually really looking forward to testing the RTX 40 series. Hopefully the supply is good. Just, it's a reminder of the 30 series. When the 30 series launched, if you were there for it, there was a ton of excitement. People were really hyped. The initial rapid sell through was expected, but no one really thought the scarcity would exist in that capacity or last as long as it did. So a little more, uh, I don't know, cautious about the 40 series launch in terms of supply. But um, from a testing standpoint, it, there's a lot of cool stuff I want to start doing with GPUs. So that'll be a good opportunity. All right. So the simple reply from Kapai Simon Kimi could also be read as an endorsement of launch dates seen on the 3dcenter.org tweet 
that Copite was replying to. Taken at face value, that would indicate launches in August, September, and October, respectively. Now, Igor from Igor's Lab guides a bit more conservatively in his article. He speculates that August or September will be the start of mass production, not the full launch. He also provides additional context and explains the timeline that's been used in recent graphics card generations from NVIDIA. Igor says that there are two distinct phases of board partner development. The first he calls learning, and the second he calls testing. In the former learning phase, the board partner has to understand the new technological requirements, and in the latter, they have to prove their designs. This more or less aligns with what we've seen over the years, which is that board partners will trial things for as long as they can before they have to ship cards, but sometimes, a couple of the recent, actually both AMD and NVIDIA launches come to mind. Sometimes the board partners get a reference board dumped on them and GPU supply, and they're told, make it cooler for this. There's no time to design your own custom PCB. It's got to go out the door in three to four weeks. So uh, it just depends on what the launch is like. Now, interestingly, Igor sources in his article claim AD102 PCBs are currently in testing and are pin compatible with the 3090 Ti series cards. That would be GA102 GPUs. This aligns with the rumor that we saw previously, which was that the 3090 Ti was functionally a test vehicle for the upcoming 40 series cards. We've actually shown some socketable GPU enclosures in the past, like at MSI's factory, where they could use something like this, like a 3090 Ti test vehicle to test 40 series cards, for example, uh, to get a better idea of the power requirements, the power behavior, the clock behavior, things like that, so they can design their vBIOS is appropriately. So uh, basic power and thermal testing is underway using GO102 packages and a 600 watt vBIOS applied according to Igor's co commentary in his article. And this could mean that the 4090 series are effectively using 3090 Ti PCBs with some tweaks then like for power delivery. So that'd mean that the 3090 Ti served at double duty as a Proto 4090 test bed and as a product. Now this leads into the next rumor from the NVIDIA side, which is the GTX 1630 coming out in June. Previously it was rumored as uh, May 31st and it's changed to June 15th. So the RTX 40 cards aren't the only new ones coming from NVIDIA. AMD will also have the GTX 1630 to compete with. And by compete, we mean not that, because it's not particularly high end. In a leak posted by Video Cards, they claim a new partner embargo has gone out with a date of June 15th for general availability, but there's no media embargo mentioned. Just for reference, so the Video Cards table they show, we've seen this in previous launches, it looks legitimate to us, it looks like how NVIDIA formats these things. They have a partner embargo where it's when the partners start to uh, be able to either launch the product or at least detail the products publicly. It's if they have physical supply or not. Then there's media embargoes for reviews, things like that. So uh, historically, NVIDIA has not sampled these blank blank 30 cards. So like GT 1030, they don't really sample that to media. Uh, GT 730, GT 710, that stuff that if you see reviews, likely the outlet has gone out to buy it themselves. NVIDIA doesn't make a big deal sending it out for reviews. We've mostly bought them when we looked at them. Now in the 30 series, not the 3000 series, the GT 1030, the GT 730 have had a lot of shenanigans over the years, mostly relating to changing the memory supply or <laughs> refreshing six or eight year old GPUs and rebranding them. So we'll keep a close eye on the GTX 1630. Notably though, it does have an X in the name. It's not just GT. So it's likely to be at least perceived as comparatively higher end than previous X30 launches. Now, previously, rumors pointed toward the GTX 1630 replacing the 1050 Ti, a Pascal GPU from 2016. The 1050 Ti was a $140 card at launch, although there were a few versions, and currently NVIDIA doesn't have a card in the $140 to $200 price range. The RTX 3050 comes closest, but its MSRP is $250. Quite a jump over what the 1050 cost. If the 1630 follows the general climb in prices against each rank in the GPU naming hierarchy, then $140 seems like a likely spot to land. It's something that a previous 50 non-TI card would be at. The 30 cards have also mostly been in the $100 and below price class previously. If you look up the GT 1030's MSRP, that was $80. So this would be a steep climb if referenced mostly by name, but relative performance matters most. Just for some perspective, since this is meant to replace a 1050 Ti, we went and pulled up some old data from our most recent 1050 Ti retest we did from Rainbow Six Siege at 1080p, just for a reference point. And the Pascal card ran at 96 FPS average in this charge. That had the 1050 Ti as worse than the GTX 970, which again was only one generation before that, or compared to more recent cards, it allowed the RX 6500 XT a lead of 87%, with the GTX 1660 XE Ultra leading by 95%.
Hopefully, the GTX 1630 runs a little faster. Current rumors suggest that the 1630 will have less memory bandwidth than the 1050 Ti, despite a higher rumored memory speed, and that's due to the rumored 64-bit bus width. That said, Delta color compression technologies have improved, the architecture has improved, uh, CUDA cores aren't one-to-one -one with the 10 series, so even though the CUDA core count is lower in the GTX 1630 than a 1050 Ti, they perform differently, so you have more efficient cores, at least, in the newer architectural generations. So it's hard to, at a glance, look at the paper specs and know exactly where the 1630 is going to fall. We'll just have to test it, and we will. We'll have, we'll be buying one if, uh, if we don't get one otherwise. So, uh, next one. In a bit of Intel CPU-related news, another frequent leaker makes an appearance this week. It's TUM underscore APISAK on Twitter, posting a result from user benchmark alleged to be an engineering sample of the upcoming Raptor Lake architecture. The sample, named U3E1, probably engineering one there, reported 24 cores and 32 total threats. We don't necessarily like using user benchmark for benchmarks uh, for a lot of reasons. It's just sort of, it's an entirely uncontrolled test condition. It tends to not only just buy software engineering favor one brand over the other, but also the developers of it, who should probably be about as impartial as you can get because they build a tool to do the analysis, the developers of it go on these weird, crazy rants and rampages about Gamers Nexus and Hardware Unboxed. So uh, anyway, we don't typically reference user, <laughs> user benchmark, but for this one, we can gain at least an extremely high level indicator of what the performance of the sample might be compared to other things in user benchmark for Intel. So versus the 12900K user benchmark results, the leaked sample posted 6% faster single core numbers for whatever that's worth. And we trudged through the overly Intel biased landmines laid by user benchmark to check a threader for 3960X CPU as well, which also has 24 cores. We saw that user benchmark claims the new Intel CPU is 51% better in average score. And upon looking at how that score <laughs> is built, we saw that being 30 months newer is quote, hugely more recent and therefore worth 100% more points in this category. Now, clearly this shows that we can trust the user benchmark rankings and it gives a lot of insight to where the CPU will fall. The reason we can trust the rankings is because... Moving on, NZXT has new Z690 motherboards coming out, finally launching. NZXT starts its press release with, quote, what is up? Fellow gamers, is that, is that actually, that's actually, okay. I wasn't sure if that was our joke, or, but I'm being told that NZXT made, made that joke. So NZXT apparently self-aware for this one, being a little bit late after the other Z690 launches. Now for these new Z690 motherboards, NZXT has the N5 and the N7. And for the naming, if you're curious about the naming scheme, the N we think stands for NZXT, and the 7 stands for seven months late after the Alder Lake launch. Kind of a weird name, but okay. The two new boards are simply named the N7Z690 and N5Z690. To be fair, these are somewhat refreshing names compared to the X670 Extreme Extreme motherboards we've been talking about recently. But for the NZXT boards, first off, the higher tier board is the N7 at $300 US. The CPU vCore VRM looks to be a 12-phase design. It has four DDR4 slots, not DDR5, which actually is a choice that we're fine with, considering DDR5 is still uh, extremely expensive, I believe is the scientific term for it. Three M.2 slots for storage are present. The first two appear to be PCIe Gen 4, while the third is either PCIe Gen 4 or SATA. For PCIe, there are three physical by 16 slots for full length. There's PCIe Gen 5 by 16, Gen 4 by 4, and Gen 3 by 4. And then there's two PCIe 3.0 by 1 slots. Now, in terms of Wi-Fi and Bluetooth capabilities, these come in an additional M.2 companion RF module in an E-key Sicket. Clear CMOS and BIOS flashback buttons are on the rear I.O., which are nice to have. CAM is tightly integrated for fan and RGB control if you want to deal with it. And visually, the N7 sports a usual NZXT look with the flat white or black panels covering almost the entire board. The sections near the PCIe slots are held on with magnets and cover the M.2 slots and the CMOS battery. Now this, we haven't used these new NZXT boards. You got opinions on those in a second. But this is at least an improvement where Previously, NZXT was burying the CMOS battery, so if you had to pull it, 
to reset the board because sometimes the CMOS reset buttons just really don't seem to quite work the same way, then you have to take apart basically the entire NTXT motherboard, which means you have to take it out of the system. You couldn't just pull the CMOS battery and leave the system built. You had to go take everything out and then remove the cover, which was entirely cosmetic, to get the battery. So NTXT, thank you for adding magnets. We still don't know how that technology works. We've been trying to figure it out for years, but they at least make it easier to take the CMOS batteries out. Now, as for general opinions here, so we for years had NZXT motherboards in some of our production systems, in two of them. We built two identical systems with the same motherboards, the same CPU 8086Ks, and the same RAM, basically the same everything. And they had very distinct behaviors, despite being mostly the same. All of the behavioral problems we had with those systems stemmed from the NZXT BIOS. We're not sure if it's better on these. Hopefully it is. One would assume it's improved with time. But we just want to caution here that uh, those boards, you, after dealing with them for a year or two on our production systems, we would never deal with them again unless they've seriously improved. So, And it was all BIOS related for those. As far as those NZXT boards go, we're a little bit concerned about the chipset thermals. Without having it, though, and probably we won't test it. It's hard to know exactly if they're a problem. Uh, the heatsink appears to be pretty small. You can see it a little bit in the renders, and it's entirely covered by a cosmetic cover with no physical attachment or really dissipation capability to that chipset heatsink. So uh, without any discernible contact, it's just sort of covering up and trapping the heat more than anything. Now, the lower tier N5 board will be $240, still kind of expensive. Uh, differences from the N7 include mostly an eight-phase V-Core VRM, so it's reduced in its sort of overclocking capabilities. It has four M.2 slots, including one that is uniquely positioned on the rear of the board. There's less USB support overall, reduced analog audio outputs, no rear clear CMOS button, and a somewhat better looking chipset heatsink. Visually, there are fewer of the cover plates resulting in a more modest but good looking board. One thing to point out is that NDXC's product page of the N5 lists what it calls, quote, optical spadiff, as we like to call it, audio output on the rear I.O while not being actually physically present in the images. So NZXT should probably pay closer attention to details like this in case someone actually wants to buy one of these motherboards individually instead of being forced to buy it through the BLD ecosystem. Sticking with the motherboard themes news, ASRock has new boards for AM5, the upcoming Zen 4 socket that AMD's working on. So a quick reminder here, X670 and X670E, it's, it's one chipset. It's all just the X670 chipset. The E designates where the PCIe lanes are being split on those motherboards. It's the only thing you need to know about that. So uh, ASRock has announced five new socket AM5 boards. They have the blazing M.2 slot, that's the name of it. It's not our, not our descriptor, uh, for PCIe Gen 5 by 4 uh, SSDs. And then one of the boards has a bit of a unique look, but let's just go through the names first. So the boards are the X670E Tai Chi Carrera, the X670E Tai Chi, the X670E Steel Legend, the X670E Pro RS, and the X670 Non-E PG Lightning. The two Tai Chi motherboards seem functionally identical based on the little information that we currently have from the product pages and from the images themselves, but the marble look of the Tai Chi Carrera is the eye-catching part and certainly stands out in the fields of endless black plus RGB motherboards. And this is where we need your comment. Post below. What do you think of the Tai Chi Carrera? Let's we'll put that on screen again. So simple question, yes or no? Although I guess just make clear that you're talking about the Tai Chi Carrera would be a little confusing. These boards both feature a huge 26 phase VRM, two PCIe Gen 5 slots, by 16 and by 8 and four M.2 slots. The M.2 slots include the new blazing M.2 Gen 5 slot, which is definitely better than the hyper ones, which also exist. These are clearly high-end boards, and you can expect lots of bells and whistles to be included, uh, but we won't know more until close to the AM5 launch. Now, the Pro RS motherboard is the only one with a picture so far other than the Tai Chi Carrera and Tai Chi line, and it appears to be a more modest affair with fewer flashy aesthetics options, uh, but it still has that blazing M.2. Now, interestingly here, all of these boards have 2.5 gigabit Ethernet, so that shows that multi-gig 
Is that a thing? It's going to be a thing now. Uh, Multi-gig is continuing to catch on as a stopgap between 1 gigabit and 10 gigabit Ethernet. This next one's actually really cool. It's not something we're going to test most likely or use. Maybe. We'll see. But super cool anyway. So this is a tiny passive power supply from the company HDplex. We have no experience with HDplex, uh, but this one, it's an extreme small form factor product. It was too interesting to pass up reporting on because it's a 250 watt passively cooled power supply at 94% efficiency. HDplex has had other more powerful but still tiny ATX power supplies in the past by way of doing the AC to DC conversion in a separate brick unit, similar to how it's done in laptops. So HDplex boasts that they have the world's smallest ATX power supply by using gallium nitride or GANFET, an LLC plus PFC structure, and a unibody flat transformer. Gallium nitride FETs were first seen in ATX power supplies, at least first seen by us, in Corsair's comparatively gigantic AX1600i. 250 watts admittedly doesn't get you very far in today's landscape of power-hungry silicon, so it's possible to link two of them together for a combined 500 watts of power. HDplex suggests using one to power the motherboard and the CPU, while the other one powers the GPU. This might not sound like a lot, but the power density alone and the brickless nature opens up a lot of opportunities for the small form factor enthusiasts. This palm-sized power supply will cost $145 US and it's expected to be available this month. No guarantees that we'll test this one. We just wanted to highlight it because it's interesting. So uh, maybe, but it at least looks cool. Next one, Thermal Grizzlies LGA 1700 contact frame. You may have heard of this one. This is another overclocking oriented product from Thermal Grizzly and it's designed by, of course, Extreme Overclocker Der Bauer. The LGA 1700 CPU contact frame claims to address issues brought on by the LGA 1700 loading mechanism in conjunction with the elongated package Intel provided for Alder Lake. Thermal Grizzly explains it pretty well here. Quote, the standard ILM has contact points that are in the middle of the elongated CPU. The surface of the integrated heat spreader, or IHS, curves concavely due to the resulting uneven contact pressure of the processor in the socket. As a result, the base plate of the CPU cooler rests primarily on the edges of the IHS so that the thermal hotspot in the center of the CPU is not optimally covered. Thermal Grizzly continues and says, quote, the Intel 12th gen CPU contact frame has a special inner contour to shift the contact pressure from the center of the CPU to the edges during assembly. This avoids the concave curvature of the IHS, they say, and this means that the CPU cooler rests better on the processor and a larger contact surface is created to dissipate the waste heat of the CPU. Terbauer has a video where he shows the installation for the contact frame as well as the process for lapping the CPU for optimal flatness if you want to go that far. Shipping has begun to retailers. So they'll be available soon, if not already. We're expecting to get some of these in. I just got a notice from FedEx saying uh, it's time to pay customs fees. And it was a shipment from Germany. So I'm thinking that's probably it. Uh, we're hoping to review it. I'm not sure if we'll do a standalone video or just something on GN extras or a news. Depends how much depth we provide to it. But uh, it should be fairly straightforward using our test processes to benchmark. So if we can get to it, uh, we'll have some thermal data for you. So for the last story, Patrick and I are actually kind of excited about this aspect of the industry right now, which is handheld gaming PCs, just because the Steam Deck was really fun to work on. Now, whether or not it's worth buying, that kind of depends on how you play games. Personally speaking, strictly and subjectively, I probably wouldn't use a Steam Deck type device too frequently. Maybe when I'm flying, but I. I mean, I, I tend to just work instead when I'm doing that. So, but we do really like them from a technological standpoint for testing. They open up interesting possibilities. And the reason it's particularly interesting here is because of how much competition the Steam Deck has brought to this market. So things like the IA Neo and GPD Win series devices have existed a long time. Now there's just a lot more eyes on it, which is great. That means that this part of the market is developing, and because a major player with billions of dollars came in, the smaller players now are able to benefit from that marketing indirectly. Well, actually directly, without, but just without paying for their own marketing. Anyway, there's a couple new ones we wanted to talk about from this week. So uh, AYN just launched its new Loki handheld. We're going to call them Aimtech. And that's a portable PC running Windows OS. It's equipped with an AMD Zen 3 6600U APU, and it's one of AMD's newer 6 nanometer solutions in this device. This is accompanied by an M.2 SSD. It's got USB 4.0, 
Wi-Fi 6E, it's got Bluetooth. It's actually fairly robust in the I.O. department for a small handheld. It also has a set of colorful chassis options, including just simple white and black for the plastic coloring. And they've got custom vinyl stickers offering yellow, Game Boy Purple, NES or SNES style coloring and other options as well. We actually kind of like how the chassis looks though. Face buttons are standard. There's a D-pad on the left. There are two analog joysticks present. No dual touch pads to be seen like you see on the Steam Deck. Uh, Ain notes that the OS support for Ubuntu and Windows 10 is present and it highlights that game streaming is an option when internal hardware proves insufficient. So for the Loki, which is their new one, that has an X-axis linear motor for rumble support, clearly taking a page from early Steam Deck criticism to offer an alternative, if not an improvement. And this is one we'd actually really like to review. So if you're from AYN Tech, you see this, uh, reach out and let me know two things. One, am I supposed to pronounce AYN or spell it? <laughs> and then two, let's talk about the device. We'll buy one if, uh, if we don't get a review sample, but um, we have some questions about it. All right, Aya Neo, whose products we have reviewed in the past, also has some new stuff coming out. So uh, you might remember Aya Neo for its strange and bizarre connection with a brand called Wizman. <laughs> Famous for things like the, the Mario Jane handheld. It's, we didn't really, it's weird. You should watch the video. <laughs> but they have some new stuff too. Notably, there's a new Aya Neo 2 Geek and Aya Neo Air Plus. The Aya Neo Air Plus has an AMD Mendocino APU, which was just announced recently. Uh, the Aya Neo showed all of this in a six hour long live stream entirely in Chinese. Uh, fortunately, we were able to parse through it and get some information out of this for you. So the Aya Neo 2 Geek will be running Ryzen 7 6800U parts and RDNA 2 GPUs. The pricing will land at $800 USD uh, maximally, and the Aya Neo Air Plus will be $290, making it one of the cheaper handhelds right now, of course. It will also be less capable. Um, they had a lot of commentary in there about look and feel and sort of using the device, um, working with it mechanically, but uh, in terms of hard specs, that's kind of what we got from this one. So that's it for this time. Thanks for watching. As always, subscribe for more. Go to store.gamersnexus.net to help us out directly and grab something like one of the blueprint shirts. You get something cool in return or patreon.com slash gamersnexus. We're up and rolling producing stuff regularly again now. So you're gonna see videos on Monday for the big Steam Deck content we have, and then pretty much every day after that for a lot of other stuff that we're rolling out. And as for Patreon, we've got some bonus videos over there that we've just published recently. Thanks for watching. We'll see you all next time.